Hi class, this is Professor Harmony Kim. Today you will study Pikuni ordination in the Theravada Buddhism. We know that the Buddha established the Pikuni Sangha. Officially, sanctioned Pikuni ordination disappeared from the Theravada Buddhist tradition centuries ago. The true Dhamma is now established in many Western countries, such as Australia. In the West, the absence of Pikuni is seen as a major defect of Buddhism. The lack of a female equivalent to the Theravada Buddhist monk is a big reason why many Westerners do not become Buddhist. Ajahn Brahm stated that if we do not establish a Pikuni Sangha, then Buddhism will not last even another 50 years in the West. The Holiness Dalai Lama called First International Congress on Buddhist Women's Role in the Sangha. The subtitle is Pikuni Vinaya and Ordination Lineage. This conference was held at the University of Hamburg from July 18 through 20, 2007. This forum aimed to discuss the revival of Pikuni. The Dalai Lama insisted that monks and nuns from all traditions contribute to the debate as well as academic learned in the Vinaya. So many scholars also attend this forum. The Congress consisted of presentation from 65 monks, nuns, academics, and Buddhist lay people. All offers an equivalent support for the prospect of Piguni ordination. They delve into the origin of Piguni, dissected the story of the first ordination, Analyze the Garudharma. Garudharma, I will introduce a little bit later. They told of the early development of Buddhism, described the situation for Piguni throughout history in Sri Lanka, China, Tibet, Korea, Vietnam, and elsewhere. Also, the participant showed the situation for Buddhist renunciate women in various cultures today and their prospect for the future. Also, they explain how in 443 CE, the Piguni lineage had been taken from Sri Lanka to China and was returned from China to Sri Lanka. They also evaluated how the existing Vinaya provide models for Piguni ordination in the Tibetan tradition. Some of these topics are covered in this lecture. The Dalai Lama has consistently supported Piguni ordination and has given his permission for women to take Piguni ordination in the East Asian tradition. A significant handful of women have been in robes for over 20 years and are teachers and leaders of their own communities. In Buddhism, we do not have the problem that our founders' closest disciples are all men. We know that the Buddha established the Pikuni Sangha, so Pikuni ordination does not require any rewriting or adaptation of our ancient scriptures. Theravadin cultures have developed various ordination platforms to substitute for the absence of Pikuni, such as the Eight Precepts in Pali, Mechi, Ten Precepts, Dasatilamata, and so on. Many nuns practicing within these forums in Thailand, Burma, England, and elsewhere are content with their roles, and also they fear that Pikuni ordination will disrupt their limited but 
familiar lives. For such women, the existing renunciate forms will remain the preferred option. Only Pikuni ordination platform is founded on the pattern of the Buddha's dispensation, which is recognized universally by all Buddhist traditions. Any other ordination platform must be limited and local and will never attain comparable spiritual depth or institutional authority. One of the greatness of Buddhism is that from its outset it was transnational and non-ethnic. Later traditions have developed strongly ethnocentric or nationalistic models for the Dhamma, and while these may have had a certain usefulness, they can never supplant supplant the authentic dispensation. If the Sangha remains ethnocentric, how can they act as leaders for a lay community that is increasingly globalized? This is a cruel dilemma facing traditional Sanghas in many Buddhist countries today. The original Buddhist Sutra and Vinaya offers us the ideal framework for nurturing the growth of the Sangha. While traditional Sanghas retreat from the future into a fantasized past, we greet the future with hope. Officially, sanctioned Piguni ordination disappeared from the Theravada Buddhist tradition centuries ago. The last evidence for the existence of the original Piguni Sangha in a country following Theravada Buddhism date from Sri Lanka in the 11th century. Beginning in the late 1990s, the revival of the Piguni ordination has been on the way in the Theravada world, spearheaded by monks and nuns from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. With the support of a number of learned monks, Sri Lankan women had sought have sought to restore the long-vanished order of loans not only to a place in their nation's heritage, but to the religious life of international Theravada Buddhism. While monastic ordination has never been an absolute requirement for spiritual practice and attainment in Buddhist, through the centuries, the life blood, life blood of the Buddhist tradition has flowed through its monastery and hermitages. Even today, in this age of electronic commerce and higher technology, the call to the simple monastic life still inspires many women as well as men. Yet, in most countries that follow the Theravada tradition, women are allowed to enter only upon subordinate forms of renunciate life. The heritage of formally sanctioned monastic ordination prescribed in the ancient canonical text is denied them. Now, let's look into the stage of Piguni ordination. Monastic ordination as a Piguni involve three stages. The first stage is called Pabaza. This stage is just going first into homelessness 
or novice ordination, just person who want to get ordination, leave their house, therefore they become homelessness and become novice. Second stage is the Sikamana training. This stage prepare the candidate for full ordination. The last stage is called Upasampada or full ordination. Let's look at the Sikamana, the intermediate stage, the second stage, a little bit detail. The Sikamana training. Before female can take Upasampada, a woman candidate must live as a Sikamana or probationer. And this probationer trained in six rules for a period of two years. She receives a status of a Sikamana through a Sangha a legal act of the Sangha. This act is performed by the Pikuni Sangha, not by the Piku Sangha. Therefore, in the absence of a Pikuni Sangha, a female candidate for ordination has no way to become a Sikamana. So there is a problem in case of lack of Pikuni Sangha. It is impossible to become a Sikamana. Without becoming a Sikamana, female candidate will not be able to fulfill the prescribed training leading to Upasampada. After completing her training in the six rules, a Sikamana must obtain an agreement from the Sangha on authorization to take Upasampada, and this agreement is given by a Piku Ni Sangha. Therefore, these two steps along the way to Upasampada, namely the agreement to train in the six rules during Sikamana training and the agreement confirming that the candidate has complete the two years training in the six rules, both agreement have to be conferred by a Pikuni Sangha. Then the female candidate can receive full ordination. What happened if Piku Nisanga does not exist? In the absence of a Theravada Piku Nisanga, a Vinaya expert say a candidate for Piku Ni ordination cannot pass through these two steps. Therefore, female candidate will not be qualified for full ordination. The last book of the Pali Vinaya Pitaka, known as the Parivara, is a technical manual dealing with the fine points of Vinaya observance. Among the stipulation of the Parivana, an Upasampada can fail on account of the candidate, on account of the motion, on account of the announcement, on account of a boundary, and on account of the assembly. Conservative Vinaya experts sometimes argue that a woman who has not undergone training as a Sikamana is not a qualified candidate, and thus Upasampada given to her will be invalid. Upasampada is the full ordination stage. In the case of a Piku ordination, Na Piguni, Piku ordination, the ordination of a monk, Upasampada, is administered by an act known as ordination with a motion as the fourth. First, the spokesman for the Sangha makes a motion to the Sangha to give ordination to the candidate with a certain senior monk as preceptor. Then he makes 
three announcement that the Sangha ordained the candidate with the senior monk as preceptor. Any monk present who disapprove is invited to voice up objection. Finally, if no monk has objected, he concludes that the Sangha has given ordination to the candidate with the senior monk as a preceptor. When the Pikuni Sangha was first established, the same method must have been used to ordain women as Pikuni. However, after Pikuni Sangha gained maturity, this method was replaced by another, which involved the participation of both the Pikuni Sangha and the Piku Sangha. Both, in other words, Piku and Pikuni Sangha ordain the candidate by separate processes following in close succession, each with a motion and three announcements. This method is therefore called ordination through a proclamation. The sixth Garudamma, Garudamma means monastic rules, states that after training as a Sikamana for two years in the six rules, the woman should seek Upasampada from a dual Sangha from both the Biguni Sangha and the Piku Sangha. The Chula Vaga section of the Vinaya describes that the candidate first takes ordination from the Bikuni Sangha and then comes before the Piku Sangha to undergo the second ordination involving another motion and three announcement and confirmation. Just before I mention about Garudamma, it's a monastic rule. So I will briefly introduce what are the Garudamma. There are eight Garudamma. These are the precepts that Pikuni need to keep. First, a nun who has been ordained even for a hundred years must greet respectively, rise up from her seat, salute with joined palms, do proper homage to a monk, ordained but that day. A nun must not spend the rain, three months rainy retreat, rainy season, in a residence where there are no monks. Every half month, a nun should desire two things from the order of monks, the asking as to the date of the observance day and the coming for the exhortation. After the rains, a nun must invite before both orders in respect of three matters, namely what was seen, what was heard, and what was suspected. A nun offending against an important rule must undergo manata discipline for a half a month before both orders. This means Tanisaro Bhikkhu translated this in a way that a bhikkhuni who has broken any of the vows of respect must undergo penance for half a month on the both Sangha. The sixth monastic rule is when, as a probationer, she has trained in the six rules for two years, she should seek higher ordination from both orders. Haryu ordination means the stage of Upasampada. A monk must not be abused or reviled in any way by a nun. From today, admonition of monks by nuns is forbidden. These are the eight precepts that Pigunis must keep. We go back to the situation in which what happened if Pigu Ni Sangha, 
does not exist. The main legal objection that conservative Vinaya legalists raise against a revival of Biguni ordination is that it must be given by an existing Biguni Sangha and to be a purely Theravada ordination, it must come from the existing Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha. In the absence of an existing Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha, a legitimate Theravada Bhikkhuni ordination cannot be granted. The ordination cannot be self-generated, but must be continuation of an existing tradition. Monks to attempt to reconstitute a broken Pikuni Sangha is to claim a privilege unique to a perfectly enlightened Buddha, and no one but the next Buddha can claim that. So it is a dilemma to ordain Pikuni unless the Buddha reappears. In the Chulavaga, it says, Piku. I allow Piku to give Upasampada to Pikuni, rightly pointing out the Buddha never revoke that allowance. However, it would be incorrect to say that the Buddha gave permission in perpetuity to the Piku to ordain Pikuni on their own. As long as there were no Pikuni in existence, that is, at the very inception of the Pikuni Sangha, it was only natural that the Buddha's allowance to the Piku to ordain Pikuni would be applied in this way because there was simply no other way it could be applied. Thereafter, the allowance continued, but it did not mean that Piku on their own could ordain Pikuni. The Buddha did not revoke this allowance because the allowance was necessary after the dual Sangha ordination procedures was initiated. If the Buddha had revoked the permission he had earlier given to Piku to ordain Pikuni, then the Piku Sangha would not have been entitled to give ordination after the Pikuni Sangha gave its ordination. When the new procedures were introduced, with the Pikuni Sangha conferring ordination first, the allowance to the Piku to ordain Pikuni was integrated into the new two-stage ordination. So the permission remained intact, except that now the Piku did not act alone. The Upasampada, they were entitled to confer, followed Upasampada conferred by the Pikuni. This requirement for dual Sangha ordination became integral to the Theravada tradition's conception of the Pikuni. In the Pali Vinaya Pitaka, we encounter a standard description of a Pikuni like this. So Pikuni is defined as one who is a mendicant. Pikuni, one who arrives on arms round, one who wears a robe made of cut-up patches, one who has the designation of a pikuni, one who claims to be a pikuni, or come pikuni, pikuni, a pikuni ordained by going to the three refuges, an excellent pikuni, a pikuni by essence, a trainee pikuni, a pikuni beyond training a pikuni fully ordained by a dual sangha in harmony through an act that is unshakable and able to stand, consisting of a motion and three announcements. Among these, what is intended in this sense as a pikuni is one fully ordained by a dual sangha in harmony, 
through an act that is unshakable and able to stand the consisting of a motion and three pronouncements. In Theravada countries, the dual Sangha ordination was regarded as mandatory. We found in the Vinaya Pitaka occasional mention of the Ekato Upasampana, in other words, one ordained on one side. And we might suppose this means that some Pikuni continue to be ordained solely by the Pigu Sangha. However, this would be a misinterpretation of the expression. The expression Ekato Upasampana refers to a woman who has received ordination solely from the Pikuni Sangha, but not yet from the Piku Sangha. It denotes a woman in the intermediate stage between ordination by the two wings of the dual Sangha. The Pali Vinaya Pitaka is scrupulously consistent in restricting the use of the word Pikuni to those who have fulfilled the dual Sangha ordination. In the Sutta Vivanga section of the Vinaya, whenever the text has occasion to gloss the word Piguni, it states, A Piguni is one who has been ordained in the dual Sangha. If a single Sangha performs the ordination, the assembly is defective because valid ordination requires the participation of the two assemblies, such as Piku and Pikuni Sangha. The motion and three announcements are also defective because only one motion and three announcements have been recited, whereas valid ordination requires two procedures, each with its own motion and three announcements. Since a Theravada Biguni Sangha no longer exists, the legalist arrives at the inevitable conclusion that there is simply no possibility of reviving the Theravada Biguni Sangha. Biguni ordination will remain out of reach throughout the duration of the present Buddha's dispensation. Conservative Theravada Vinaya authorities raise against restoring the Piguni ordination to the Theravada tradition. The factors that I will consider can be distributed into two groups. One is one might be called ancient mandate. Second, compelling contemporary circumstances. Let's look at the first factor. The primary ancient mandate is the Buddha's own decision to create a Pikuni Sangha as a counterpart to the male Piku Sangha. When the 500 women headed by Mahapajapati Gotami came to the Buddha with their heads shaped, wearing ochre robes, they did not ask the Buddha to establish an order of nuns. These 500 women just simply asked the Buddha to permit women to go further from the household life into homelessness in the Dhamma and Vinaya, proclaimed by the Tathagata. So these 500 women simply asked, Papaja stage. And I mentioned that the 500 women headed by Mahapaja Gotami. So here's image of Mahapaja Gotami, and she is the first nun, first pikuni, and actually before ordained, Mahapaja Pati was the aunt of the Shakyamuni Buddha. 
Although the Buddha at first denied this request, the Buddha finally yielded. In yielding, the Buddha did not simply agree to allow women to go forth in some secondary role, for example, as a temporary step nuns. Rather, the Buddha allowed them to take full ordination as pikuni, the female counterpart of the piku. Further, the Buddha constituted renunciant women into a distinct order, a society governed by its own rules and regulations. Though the Buddha subordinated this order to the Pikku Sangha with respect to certain functions, the Buddha still made it largely autonomous. The Buddha says that because women have received the going first, the spiritual life will not last the four thousand years that it was originally destined to last, but will instead endure only five hundred years. This prediction is one of the major stumbling blocks that conservative Theravadins raise against attempts to revive the Pikuni Sangha. We should still note a significant fact about the version that has come down in the Pali Canyon, namely that the Buddha is shown making this prediction only after he has agreed to allow women to go forth. If the Buddha truly wanted to prevent women from going forth, he would have made this prediction while Ananda was still launching his appeal on behalf of the Shakan women. Shakan women means 500 women headed by Mahapajapati Gotami. In such a case, Ananda would probably have desisted from his effort and the Piguni Sangha would never have gotten off the ground. There is little evidence that the permission to women to go forth contributed in any way to shortening the lifespan of the teaching and the time frame mentioned in the text is also difficult to reconcile with the fact of Buddhist history in so far as we can ascertain them. The text may be suggesting that the reasons for the Buddha's hesitancy was concerned that close contacts whereby intimate feelings between the two would arise and this would lead to many disrobing or to the rise of a married clergy such as we find among the Buddhist priests of Japan. But the historical record contains no indication that this happened in the course of Indian Buddhism. Other stories speak about different causes for the decline and disappearance of the good dharma, and this seems to point to factors that might play a greater role in the decline of the dharma than the conferring of ordination of women. For example, a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya says, the good dharma declines when the four assemblies dwell without respect for the dham, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, the training, Samadhi, and heedfulness. We should note that the Pikuni will also be around when the good Dharma declines and disappears, which shows that in the view of the text, the Buddha did not expect the Pikuni Sangha to die out before the Piku Sangha did. One way to interpret the Buddha's hesitancy to permit the going force of women is to see it as 
a mean of giving special emphasis to the need for caution in the relation between piku and pikunis. Let's consider a parallel. Shortly after the Buddha's enlightenment, the Buddha pondered the question whether or not to teach the Dhamma to the world. According to the text, the Buddha first declined to teach, to keep silent and dwell at ease. Then the deity Brahma had to come down from his celestial abode and persuade the Buddha to take up the task of proclaiming the Dhamma to the world. Let's look at the sutra from Samatha Nikaya in Ayachana Sutta, the request. I will hold that on one occasion when the Blessed One was newly self-awakened, he was staying at Urvela on the bank of the Niranjara River at the foot of the Gotard Banya tree. Then, while he was alone and in seclusion, this line of thinking arose in his awareness. This Dhamma that I have attained is deep, hard to see, hard to realize, peaceful, refined, beyond the scope of conjecture, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delight in attachment, is excited by attachment, enjoys attachment, for a generation delighting in attachment, excited by attachment, enjoying attachment, this conditionality and dependent horizon are hard to see. This state is hard to see. The resolution of a whole fabrication, the relinquishment of all acquisition, the ending of craving, dispassion, cessation, unbinding, and if I were to teach the Dhamma, and if others would not understand me, that would be tiresome for me, troublesome for me. Having seen this, the Buddha answered the Brahma Shampati in verse. Opens are the doors to the deathless to those with ears. Let them show their conviction. Perceiving trouble, O Brahma. I did not tell people the refined sublime Dhamma. Then Brahma Sahampati, thinking the blessed one has given his consent to teach the Dhamma, bowed down to the blessed one and circling him on the right, disappeared right there. Can you believe that the compassionate Buddha actually decided not to teach? to pass the rest of his life dwelling quietly in the forest. This hardly seemed conceivable in the light of other texts, which suggest that his career as a world teacher was already preordained. For example, Anguttara Nikaya relates that the Bodhisattva had five dreams shortly before the Buddha's enlightenment several of which foretell his role as a great teacher with many disciples, both monastics and householders. But this dramatic scene can be seen as a way of emphasizing how hard it was for the Buddha to come to a decision to teach. And the message emerges that we have to revere and treasure the Dhamma as something precious. Similarly, because the Buddha hesitated to admit women to the Sangha from fear that it would shorten the lifespan of the teaching, we can draw out the message that Piku and Pikuni have to be heedful in their dealings with one another and not indulge in frivolous socializing. The Buddha might also have hesitated because he foresaw that the creation of a Pikuni Sangha would have a place on the Piku 
the burden of educating and protecting the nuns' responsibilities that could have obstructed their own progress. Positive statement of support for the existence of Piguni can be gathered from the Sutta Pitaka. I will briefly mention three examples. The first is the well-known statement in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which the Buddha is said to have made to Mara. Mara is a kind of uh, beings who prevent Buddha from fully enlightened. When shortly after Buddha's enlightenment, the Mara, the tempter, which is Mara, urged the Buddha to pass straight away into final Nirvana without teaching others. The Buddha says to Mara, the tempter, Evil one, I will not pass into final Nirvana until I have Pikuni disciples who are competent, well-trained, confident, learned, upholders of the Dhamma, practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, practice property, conducting themselves in accordance with the Dhamma, who have learned their own teacher's doctrine and can explain it, teach it, describe it, establish it, disclose it, analyze it, elucidate it, and having thoroughly refuted rival doctrines in accordance with the reason, can teach the compelling Dhamma. According to this text, the Buddha considered well-trained Pikuni disciple one of the pillars of his teaching. Second example is another passage. This is less well-known, and this passage comes from the Mahavajagota Sutta. In this discourse, the wanderer Vajagota has been asking the Buddha whether he alone has achieved realization of the Dhamma or whether he has disciples who have also achieved realization. The wanderer inquires in turn about each class of disciple, Piku, Pikuni, celibate, male householder, and non-celibate, female householder. With each inquiry, the Buddha confirms that he has not merely 500, but many more disciples than that, who have attained the highest realization appropriate to their particular status. When the questioning is finished, Pachagota explained in a world with which the Buddha himself would surely have agreed, if the Venerable Gautama had attained success in this Dhamma, and if there were Piku who had attained success, but there were no Pikuni who had attained success in this Dhamma, then this spiritual life would be incomplete with respect to this factor. But because beside the Venerable Gautama and the Piku, there are also Pikuni who have attained success, this spiritual life is complete with respect to this factor. For Pikuni, the highest success is Arahanship, the same as for the Piku. The last example is the Sangha is known as the field of merit for the world, and why this epithet applies preeminently to the Aurian Sangha. It also extends to the monastic Sangha as the visible representation of the Aryan Sangha in the world. Therefore, in Dakina Vivanga Sutta, the Buddha discusses seven types of gift that can be made to the Sangha, and most of these include Pikuni among the recipient. These are a gift to the dual Sangha headed by the Buddha. A gift to the dual Sangha after Buddha has passed away. A gift specially for the Pikuni Sangha. A gift for selection of a Piku and Pikuni taken to represent the Sangha. And a gift for a selection of a Pikuni taken to represent the Sangha. I introduce five out of seven types of 
gift and the rest of two types of gift excluded because they are specially for the Piku Sangha. Besides these passages, the Anguttara Nikaya include a series of suttas in which the Buddha is shown appointing various pikuni to the position of most eminent in different domains of spiritual life. For example, the pikuni Kema was most eminent in wisdom, Uparabana in psychic potency, Badachana in great spiritual penetration. The compilers of the Pali Canyon also collected the verses of the elder nuns into a work called the Terigata, which offers us deep insight into the yearnings, striving, and attainment of the earliest generation of Buddhist women renunciants. When the Buddha first consented to teach, he declared, Open to them are the doors to the deathlessness. Let those who have ears release faith. Obviously, the Buddha did not intend this invitation to apply only to men, but to all who would be willing to listen to his message of deliverance from suffering. The Buddha compares the Dhamma to a chariot and says, one who has such a vehicle, whether a man or a woman, has by this vehicle drawn close to Nirvana. The poet monk Vanjisa confirms that the Buddha's enlightenment was intended to benefit Pikuni as well as Piku. In Samhita Nikaya, the Sutra says, indeed, for the good of many, the sage attain enlightenment for the Piku and Pikuni who have reached it and seen the fixed course. In the suttas, we see that the Buddha often includes Pikuni as the recipient of his teaching. When the Buddha compares himself to a farmer cultivating different fields, the Buddha likens the Piku and Pikuni jointly to the most excellent field for his teaching. In the simile of the ancient city, he says that after he had followed the noble effort path and penetrated the links of dependent origination, I explained them to the Piku, the Pikuni, the male lay followers and the female lay followers so that this spiritual life has become successful and prosperous, extended, popular, widespread, well proclaimed among gods and humans. When Sariputta devises a teaching that elucidates the path that all Buddhas take to arrive at full enlightenment, the Buddha urges him to expound this teaching to the Piku and Pikuni as well as to the male and female lay devotees. Though many people will not be mature enough to create this path to its end, in principle, no one should be hindered from doing so merely by reason of their gender. Yet, this is precisely what is done when women are prevented from taking full ordination. While dependents of the present system say that women can make just as much progress by taking up some surrogate female renunciant lifestyle as they could by becoming pikuni, the plain fact is that these subordinate renunciant roles do not meet their aspiration or give them access to the complete training laid down by the Buddha. Nor did the Buddha ever design for women renunciate such subordinate roles. 
the position that the Buddha intended for those who live the homeless life was that of a fully ordained pikuni. And if one is to be faithful to the Buddha, we should give renunciant women the role the Buddha intended for them. Further, in Asian Buddhist society, nuns who have settled for such surrogate position usually do not command the reverence from the Buddhist lay communities that Pikuni could inspire. Thus, they seldom take on a leadership role or give guidance in religious activities and social services, but linger on the margins, often appearing timid and self-conscious. This line of thinking leads directly to the reflection on the contemporary conditions that support a resuscitation of pikuni ordination. There are two such conditions noted. The first arises out of a realization that has been thrust upon Theravadins beginning around the middle of the 20th century that they are not only the Buddhists who preserved the monastic system guided by a Vinaya traceable to the early Sangha. As the communication have improved between different parts of the Buddhist world, more knowledgeable Theravadin Buddhists has come to learn that the monks and nuns of East Asia, such as Taiwan, China, Korea, Vietnam, though not Japan, while following Mahayana teachings and practice, are still governed via Vinaya with a body of rules largely identical with those laid down in the Pali Vinaya Pitaka. This Vinaya, which derives from the Dhammagutta school, is strikingly similar in many details with the Pali Vinaya. The Tibetan Buddhist monastic system is also guided by a Vinaya derived from another early school, the Mula Sarvasivadan. When the Buddhist traditions of East Asia and Tibet have orders of officially sanctioned Pikuni, the absence of a recognized Pikuni Sangha in South Asian Theravada Buddhism will be conspicuous, a glaring gap. Educated people around the world will found it difficult to empathize with the refusal of the Theravada monastic order to grant full ordination to women and will compare Theravada unfavorably with the other forms of Buddhism. Such an exclusive attitude would receive strong public disapproval today because of the vast difference between the social and cultural attitude of our age and those of India in the 5th century BC when the Buddha lived and taught. Our own age has been shaped by the ideas of the European Enlightenment, a movement that affirmed the inheritance dignity of the human person, led to the rise of democracy, ushered in such concepts as universal human right and universal suffrage, and brought demand for political equality and equal justice for all under the law. In today's world, all discrimination based on race, religion, and ethnicity is regarded as unjust and unjustiable. The remnant of primary prejudices that we are obliged to cast off in the realization that all human beings, by virtue of their humanity, are entitled to the same right that we assume for ourselves, including the right to fulfill their highest religious aspiration. The great project of the contemporary world, we might say, has been the dissolution of privilege without a sound reason, 
No one is entitled to special privilege denied to others. One of the most basic grounds for distinguishing people into the privileged and the deprived, the superiors and the subordinate, has been gender, with men in the privileged position, women in the subsidiary position, denied those privileges claimed by men. From the mid-19th century on, discrimination based on gender came to be perceived as arbitrary and unjust, a system that had been imposed on society simply because of the dominant roles that men had played in eras when social stability depended on physical strength and military force. Thus, women came to claim the right to work at professional jobs, the right to vote, the right to equal salaries, the right to serve in the military, even the right to hold the highest position in the land. As far back as 1869, John Stuart Mill wrote in the opening paragraph of his tract on the subjection of women. He says, an opinion which I have had from the very earliest period when I had formed any opinions at all on social political matters, is that the principle which regulate existing social relations between the two sexes, the legal subordination of one sex to the other, is wrong itself, and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement, and that it ought to be replaced by a principle of a perfect equality, admitting no power or privilege on the one side nor disability on the other. Now that discrimination based on gender has been challenged most everywhere in the secular sphere, it is time for its role in religious life to come up for serious scrutiny. For religion, unfortunately, remains one of its most persistent strongholds, and Buddhism is no exception to this. It is true that the Vinaya makes Pikuni subordinate to Piku and the Pikuni Sangha subordinate to the Piku Sangha, but we have to remember that the Buddha lived and taught in India in the 5th century BC and had to conform to the social expectation of the period. While certain practices that pertain to etiquette may need to be evaluated in the light of altered social and cultural conditions, the Pikku Bodhi said he is not concerned with rules governing the relationship between monks and nuns but solely with the questions of ordination. When we contemplate what line of action would be appropriate for us to take on this issue, we should not ask what the Buddha did 25 centuries ago, but what the Buddha would want us to do today. If people see Theravada Buddhism as a religion that includes male renunciant but excludes female renunciant, or which admit them only through some type of unofficial ordination, they will suspect that something is fundamentally askew, and defensive arguments based on appeal to a crane principles of a monastic law will not go very far to break down distrust. This will be an instance of the type of behavior that we meet so often in the Vinaya where those without confidence do not gain confidence, while among those with confidence some undergo vacillation. 
On the other hand, by showing that they have the courage to restore to women the right to lead a full religious life as instituted by the Buddha, that is, by reviving the Pikuni Sangha. Theravadin elders will enable their form of Buddhism to take its place in the modern world firmly and proudly. While still upholding a path is timeless and not subject to the vagaries of changing fashions. To take up this step does not mean, as some might feel that, we are meddling with the Nama and the Vinaya just to fit people's worldly expectation. The truth of the Dhamma, the principle of the path, the guidelines of the Vinaya remain intact. But it would show that we know how to apply the Dhamma and the Vinaya in a way that is appropriate to the time and circumstances and also in a way that is kind and embracing rather than rigid and rejecting. For those who favor revival of Pikuni Sangha, the fundamental starting point is the Buddha's decision to create the Pikuni Sangha. Although the Buddha may have hesitated to take this step and did so only after the intercession of Ananda, the Buddha eventually did establish an order of Pikuni and gave this order his wholehearted support. The revival of Theravada Pikuni Sangha can be seen as an intrinsic good that conforms to the innermost spirit of the Dhamma helping to bring to fulfillment the Buddha's own mission of opening the doors to the deathless to all humankind, to women as well as men. The existence of a Pikuni Sangha can function as an instrumental good. It will allow women to make a meaningful and substantial contribution to Buddhism in many of these ways that monk do. A Pikuni Sangha will also win for Buddhism the respect of high-minded people in the world who regard the absence of gender discrimination as the mark of a truly worthy religion in harmony with the noble trend of a present-day civilization. It is true the Theravada Pikuni order has been dis disappeared. So it has problem to reinitiate Pikuni ordination. There is a, some argument to reinitiate Pikuni ordination. However, when we think about gender issue and then the Buddha's intention to establish Pikuni Sangha, then it might not be impossible to reinitiate Pikuni ordination in Theravada tradition. Here's quiz Does the Pikuni Sangha exist in Theravada Buddhism in this era? And the Buddha stated that if the ordination of Pikuni were allowed, the true Dharma would last only another 500 years. Is it true or false? What is called the last stage of monastic ordination of a Pikuni? I introduce three stages. And first is Gophers. The second intermediate stage, just to keep in six rules for two years. And the last stage is full ordination. So what is the name of full ordination? So uh, once you solve this quiz and then submit the answer to my email. This is the end of lecture week 7.